Now, adjust the volume control so that the sound can be heard in all parts of the room. This is the Protect Your Assets Podcast. It's the Sandman. You get the idea? Bring me a dream. It's on the internet. Make him the cutest that I've ever seen. Go on. Give him two lips. Like it's like no cheese I've ever tasted. And tell him that it's lost. Here's the Sandman. Over Sandman. I hate taxes. I hate taxes. And you should too especially the required minimum distribution. Let's face it, you put all that money away all those years while you're working, and then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, they make you take it out and pay taxes on that money for the rest of your life. Well, there is something you can do about it, and this morning we're going to talk about three different ways that you can... I won't say get around the RMD, but certainly do something about it. I am David Hollander, your host. I am the Sandman. It's great to be with you this morning. People around here, they call me the Sandman, and that's because I help my listeners sleep well at night by answering their most troubled tax, legal, and financial questions each week. There's nothing worse than being forced to pay taxes on money you weren't expecting or didn't need in retirement. For many people who reach a certain age, this is exactly how they feel when they are forced to begin withdrawing money from their IRAs or 401ks and end up paying more taxes on their Medicare and Social Security. I'm talking about the dreaded required minimum distribution or RMD, as they call it in my industry. This is a special time of year because in the next several weeks, you're going to start receiving calls or letters about the RMD. Things are changing, and that means that you must take it this year or face a 25% penalty from the IRS. You heard me correct, 25%. I'd like to make 25%. So if you have it already, Time is running out for when you have to take your RMD. Are there any options around it? Do you have to take the RMD if the letter comes your mailbox this year? What choices do you have? Well, the dreaded and often confusing RMD will be the focus on today's show. Specifically, a handful of tips to keep the IRS off your back and your tax bill as low as possible. So if you have an IRA, 401k, 403b, 457, or TSP plan, and whether you're already taking RMDs or years away, one hit, one mishap, one mistake in this area can cost you big in taxes and penalties. So this is one show you definitely don't want to miss. This is all coming up right here on Protect Your Assets. Now, let's get started. Looks like Goldilocks is back on Wall Street this week. Data in the employment area, quite a bit of it actually, helps all the major markets. Dow Jones up 1.4%, S&P 500 up 2.5%. We're up year to date over 17%. NASDAQ up 3.2%. Very strong week for the NASDAQ year to date up 34%. That's right. MSCI International EFI Index up 2.7%, year-to-date up 8.5%, pretty respectable. 10-year Treasury yield, well, that was down a little bit this week because of what I'm about to talk about. It was down 0.1%. Oil, oil was up 7.6%, closed the week at $85.92 a barrel, had a big week. Bonds, pretty flat, up 0.2%, 96.09. So, Let's talk about Goldilocks, shall we? Remember the story with the little bear? She'd you know, break into their uh, house, have a little porridge. One was too hot, one was too cold, one was just right, then we took a nap. Well, that's what's happening right now with the stock market. And it's all doing with inflation. The Fed is definitely paying attention to the labor market when it comes to inflation. And for quite some time, as you know, we've been talking about how inflation... And the labor market particularly has been hot, 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 with no signs of changing. Well, that all just changed this past week. Call it the September onset. 
There were uh, several leading indicators. These are things that look forward as far as the job market and what's going on. And so we looked at job openings and what we call the quits, Q-U-I-T-S rate. Don't ask me why. They're showing signs right now of rolling over. So this past week we saw the JOLTS. I'm sorry I throw all these acronyms at you. That's the Job Openings and Labor Turnover Survey. This was data for July. This went to 8.8 million and the expected was 9.5 million. So that was a pretty big rise. In fact, we haven't seen anything like that since March of 2021. Think about that. It's a pretty long time, a couple years showing that the um, job openings and labor turnover is decreasing quite a bit. Next, we had ADP private payroll data. This came out for August and this came out Thursday. And this was also below expectations in that total job gains were 177,000. The market was looking for 194. And you may remember back in July, that surprise of 324,000. So this is a quote from ADP. This month's numbers are consistent with the pace of job creation before the pandemic. After two years of exceptional gains tied to the recovery, we're moving toward more sustainable growth in pay and employment as the economic effects of the pandemic recede, end quote. Now, that says it pretty well that, that uh, what's going on is jobs are starting to come down, wages are coming down, the economy is slowing down, which means inflation is coming down. The ADP report also highlighted, this is important, wage growth. So people who stayed at their jobs year over year saw a increase in salaries of about 5.9%. This was the slowest increase since October of 21. For, for people who changed their jobs, looking again for higher pay, that growth decelerated to 9.5%. This was the lowest showing since July of 21. Now, the big daddy was Friday. This was the uh, unemployment uh, rate that, that is uh, done by the, the Fed. And so this number was 3.8% in August. Payrolls increased 187,000. Again, that wasn't any sort of a big surprise. And so this, this uh, is the type of data that I'm going to call just right. And it also means no more rate hikes. And I think a rate cut for the Fed mid-24 next year. This range is what we'll call the best case scenario for stocks as it makes the Fed more likely to not hike any more rates. And this does not undermine the soft uh, no landing thesis that we've been talking about really to this point in time. The uh, other data we had this week was the core PCE price index. So this has to do with, again, prices rising. And that index rose very slightly, 0.2% month over month and 4.2% year over year. So this is what we call the Fed's preferred measure of inflation, core PCE. And this met expectations. So since inflation exploded last year, the Fed has been closely focused on labor and also what I'm going to call super core. You can quote that. I like that. Super core inflation. Uh, the figure jumped to 3.9 from 3.2 in June. But remember, the Fed's been talking about their target of at least 2%. And they said year over year, 4.4% 4, 4 is what they were looking for. So again, this this came in pretty pretty nicely. And when you're thinking about all things considering when it comes to the stock market, the economic data this past week shows that inflation is starting to subside. And this is what the Fed is looking for. And so their aggressive hawkish policy stance that they've been standing on uh, looks like they probably won't raise rates again this year. And remember, that was in flux about two, two, three weeks ago. We thought that they might do one more. But with all this data that just came out, this is very good for stocks. And so... Well, how good? Okay, so let's talk about the stock market. There's a couple things that, as you know, I look at when it comes to the market and where it's going to go. The first thing is the VIX. I don't know if, it, if you study the, the VIX. We've talked about it several times on the show, obviously, over the years. But interesting pattern developed. This is from a technical standpoint. Uh, the VIX has collapsed this past week. And uh, this past week, we saw a one-month low indicating that there is potentially 
a measurable drop in the hedging activity out there. And what this does is this leaves the market open or vulnerable to a sharp uh, illiquid decline if, again, this is a big if, if any uh, negative catalyst from nowhere comes forward. So if we see something and look at the date, it's, it's September 2nd. So, you know, September, October are typically months that in, in my business, I've been doing this for a very long time, over 30 years, that, you know, you start to get a little conservative. This, this would be the time you put the helmet on, right? Uh, and so this is, this is where we are currently, and we're going into September, October, with the VIX telling us, hey, if something happens here, get ready for a pullback. Now, we started to see that this past week in the bond market. For those of you who study bonds like I do, you know, we go over last week, we went over where the value was. Last week was a very uh, interesting point in U.S. Uh, government insured agencies. There was a, a wrinkle, as I identified last week. This week, that started to subside and go away, and rates did come down on those longer uh, treasury and uh, agencies and anything linked to credit and safety as this data came out through labor. Why? Because it shows that the Fed is most likely not to raise rates, right? So all these things do work together and make certain things happen. And so I'm starting to see that trend develop here in the stock market. And so what you need to be paying attention to is where things are going to go. So first of all, we saw, again, yields move lower this past week across the, the treasury spectrum. This will affect your CDs and all your shorter term cash that we've been talking about. It will, will start to come down. Again, these are very small moves, but they are going the other direction. The other thing is on the S&P 500. The VIX right now is signaling that if, again, some data that could be some sort of a, a tail, tailwind out of nowhere comes through, the S&P is poised to pull back. Uh, and why that is, is because the support level on the S&P right now is at a 4370. You heard me right. It's a 4370. And so right now with the S&P 500 running around 4516, any more positive data from, say, employment will help that move a little higher. How much higher? Well, 4537 is my next road roadblock, if you will. So on the upside... Look for 4537. If that were to break through, your next stop would be 4598. If we break through 4455, then you're looking at 4370 as a key support level. So I hope that gives you some strategy as you think about your S&P 500 investment or anything related to that, say, larger uh, growth index. Particularly with your uh, NASDAQ or tech-related stocks, those, those did well this week, again, as rates were coming off a little bit. And so, again, you may want to redeploy some capital in some of those areas I've been talking about the last few weeks' value. There's still some cyclicals, some good, some good price stocks out there that are paying nice dividends that you might want to rotate into before this year concludes. Remember, we don't have that many more months left. Do you have to take your required minimum distribution this year ever well find out when we come back i have so much to talk to you about this you are listening to the sandman on the protect your assets radio network we will be right back Take the first step toward reaching your financial goals and get the information that can help you live a confident retirement. That first step is going to PYAEvents.com and signing up for our next free event. That's PYAEvents.com. Now back to Protect Your Assets with David Hollander, the Sandman. Welcome back. I am David Hollander, also known as the Sandman. And you are listening this morning to Protect Your Assets. And don't you hate Paying taxes? I mean, there's nothing worse than being forced to pay tax on money you weren't expecting or didn't need. And while they want 30% or more of your hard-earned money, get ready to fork it over. For many people right now, this is September. Can you believe how fast this year has gone by? It's already September. And for me, this is tax season as your RMD letters 
are going to start coming out from your custodians telling you, hey, it's time to start taking that RMD. And you may say, well, what the heck is that all about? So for many people who reach a certain age, this is exactly the time when they feel like they're being forced to do something from their retirement accounts that they didn't want to do. And then they find out later that it affects their Medicare and their Social Security. This is called the dreaded and often very confusing, particularly in the last few years with all the rule changes, required minimum distribution. And so that's what our focus is today. And we're going to go over a handful of tips to keep the IRS off your back and your tax bill as low as possible. So if you have a 401k, an IRA, a TSP, 457, 403b, and whether you're already taking your RMD or years away, realize this, one bad mistake could cost you big time in taxes and penalties. So this is quite a topic, timely subject matter that we'll cover because remember, if you get this wrong, if you just do it incorrectly or you don't do it at all because you're not sure what to do, there is a 25% IRS penalty that will be coming your way. 25%, I mean, think about that. It'll take away all your gains from the last few years. So let's discuss the basics of the required minimum distribution. I'm gonna call this the ABCs of RMD. Get ready, get a pencil. I don't know, open up your computer, start making some notes, because here we go. All right, so first of all, RMD stands for Required Minimum Distribution. And when you are 73 now, you have to take this RMD from all of your retirement accounts and pay income tax, we're talking ordinary income tax, or so the highest type of tax, on that money. It is not 70 and a half. It's not 59 and a half. I hear this stuff all the way. This past week, I got a call from Mark who said, do I have to take my RMD at 70 and a half? No, Mark, you don't. <laughs> a qualified tax account, that means you're going to have to take it out of this type of an account, are the following. 401k, IRA, TSP, 403b, 457. Those are what we're talking, SEP IRA, Kehoe, Okay. So here's your ABCs of what you want to know when it comes to this. First, A, all right? A stands for the following. Write this down. Aggregation. Aggregation. Siri, how do you spell aggregation? Uh, the IRS requires that you calculate the RMD for each tax-deferred retirement account that you have. And so here's what I mean. And this is going to get a little complicated here, so get ready. If you have the 401k, and let's say you have multiple 401ks, because you've changed jobs throughout the last few years, right? And you just left them, started your new job, and just moved on. Well, maybe you have 403bs or 457s. This will cover the traditional IRA. Remember, Roth does not count. Roth IRAs don't count. SEP and simple IRAs, rollover IRAs. What about an inherited IRA? Yep, covered. Kehoe plan, yep. RMDs are based, this is how you figure it out, you go back to the value of that account as of December 31st, 2022. And then you divide that by your life expectancy factor. Well, what's that? Well, again, here's another one for you. Get IRS publication 590. Okay, that'll tell you your division or your expectancy factor. Once you've calculated this, how do you do that? Well, you take the 1231 balance, you divide it by the IRS formula based on your life expectancy factor, and then that will give you a number. And so once you calculate that number or that RMD for each, you heard me right, for each retirement account, you can aggregate the total. And here's the key, you can withdraw that RMD from one of those accounts if you want to do so. Well, why might you do that? Well, because maybe you have a really good stock and one you don't want to sell it and then the others you don't. Hmm, interesting. However, if you have a 403B, this RMD should be calculated separately and the total amount can be withdrawn from any one or a combination of those accounts. Keep in mind that a 403B cannot be aggregated with IRAs, okay? 
All right. So you see, that's a little, little complex there. How about B? Well, B is for beginning withdrawals. Remember, A, B, C. So now we're on B. When should you take your first RMD? Well, the year you turn 73, you're required to take the distribution from all IRAs and likely most other qualified plans like 401ks. But note this, with 401ks, you can avoid, you heard me, you can avoid, you can postpone it. You don't have to do it, the RMD, from your current, current employer's plan if you're still working and you don't own 5% or more of the company. You would, however, need to take RMDs from any previous employer's 401k. So here's a good idea. If you're turning 73 this year, well, maybe you might want to aggregate, remember, A, aggregate all your 401ks into your current plan, if that's possible. And guess what? Now you just delayed having to take that and pay tax on it while you're making all that money at work. Hmm, not a bad idea. C, C is for consider your taxes. This might be a great time. It is September, you got a few more months left to consider a Roth conversion. If you can't make a Roth contribution because you make too much money, well, you still can do a Roth conversion because there is no limit on that. And Congress just passed a law last December, which further encourages that. So we have strategies that we can show you that would make sense to do that even while you're still working and use these significant uh, distributions now to keep your tax bracket under a controllable level before later when you're going to have to pay so much more on that. Now, I know this is not simple. In fact, it sounds confusing because it's supposed to be, obviously. The deeper you get into this, it's sort of like, when's this ever going to end, right? That's why it makes a lot of sense to meet with the team at the Liberty Group who looks at these sorts of decisions every day. My team will find out how to do that right now by getting my complimentary on-track retirement review. You can get that right now at no charge because you're listening to me right now. Call this number, 866-PROTECT. That is 866-776-8328. Pick up the phone right now. Stop paying more in taxes. You can do something about it. After all, Pick up the phone. It is your money. 866-PROTECT. My team's working here on a Saturday. We're ready to talk to you. Give us a call and get your on-track retirement review. John D. Rockefeller said, quote, The surest way to accumulate wealth is to not pay tax on income you're not using. Coming up next, it's time for our popular They Say segment and find out where I'll discuss a way to eliminate your RMD forever, doing what John D. did. You're listening to Protect Your Assets with David Hollander. That's me. We'll be right back. Take the first step toward reaching your financial goals and get the information that can help you live a confident retirement. That first step is going to PYAEvents.com and signing up for our next free event. That's PYAEvents.com. Now back to Protect Your Assets with David Hollander, the Sandman. Welcome back. Protect Your Assets. I am David Hollander. And I also am known as the Sandman around here, and that's because I help my listeners sleep well at night. For over the past 30 years of helping people like you prepare and enter retirement, you could say, well, we've learned a thing or two. So on today's show, we are sharing some of our secrets on ways to deal with the required minimum distribution. All right, now it's time for one of our fan favorite parts of the show, our They Say segment where we debunk common myths, half-truths, and just sometimes bad advice that they say. Who are they? What do they know that I don't? And what are they saying this week? Here's David Hollander, the Sandman's answer. All, I know is I don't All right, so here's one they say. In fact, I heard this several times this past week. They say that you have to, you must take your RMD when you turn 73 every time. Well, 
First of all, do you turn 73 over and over again? Well, some people say you do. There's a book I'm reading right now about living longer that says you can reverse your age. Hmm, okay, so maybe you could go back in time. And Anyway, uh, is that always true or is there a way to get around that? Well, if you are years away from your RMD age, in other words, you're under age 73, then there's really only one choice to legally eliminate the required minimum distribution. And that is dun, 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 Roth IRA. You heard it. Roth IRAs are the only retirement account that are not subject to RMD rules over your lifetime because they are tax free and the government receives no economic benefit from you withdrawing money from a Roth. So to keep you out of the IRS crosshairs, if you wish to convert to Roth and you're age 73 or older, you have to follow this three-step approach. So again, write this stuff down because it's complicated and you want to make sure you do it right. Step one, first, you must satisfy your RMD. So if you turn 73, pull the RMD out. Step two, you pay taxes, ordinary income taxes on that. And then step three, you convert what's left, those after-tax dollars, to the Roth IRA. Now, I know that the Roth IRAs are probably the most, or one of the most, valuable retirement accounts because they're unshackled from government taxation. They are tax-free, and really nothing is better than tax-free. Well, except free money. But what if you don't have any or much in Roth IRAs right now? Are you stuck with the dreaded RMD? Well, I am an attorney, and of course, the answer depends on how much of a giving heart you have. If you give to nonprofits like your favorite charities each and every year, well, then there is a way to keep the IRS happy by fulfilling your RMD duty while simultaneously avoiding the tax on your RMD distribution. Now, this is called another acronym, sorry. QCD. You want to write this down and I'm going to break it down for you. Let's let's talk about what QCD stands for. First of all, it stands for a qualified charitable distribution. Next, you and your spouse, I'm talking about each of you, could give up to $100,000, you heard me right, $100,000 from your retirement account when you are 73 without counting that distribution as taxable income through this QCD mechanism. Now, normally, when you take money out of your IRA, it is a taxable event. The withdrawal adds to your ordinary income, and this inflates your adjusted gross income, your AGI, on your 1040. Then if you give the amount to charity, the charitable gift reduces your taxable income by the amount of the gift, but this is the key, it does not reduce your AGI. So what I'm teaching you right now is a way to avoid this phenomenon. Why? Well, because a QCD is not taxable income in the first place, it has no effect on your AGI. This is important. Because itemized deductions phase out if your AGI gets to a certain level, your exemptions phase out, Roth contribution eligibility phases out, and most importantly, the one that you may not be too aware of yet is what's called the net investment income surtax on Medicare and the taxability, you heard me right, your, your Social Security can become taxable again depending on certain credit phase-outs. This is all driven by AGI. So a QCD goes directly from your IRA to the charity, and therefore it does not count as part of your AGI. Okay? Ah. So to fully count as a QCD, again, here's where this gets a little weird, there's three factors that you have to satisfy or else you blow it, okay? And this is where, again, this is where the law is a little strange. And I don't know why, but it is what it is. And you need to know this. So first, a QCD must come from a traditional IRA or, for those of you who inherit an IRA, you know, you have to take it out over 10 years or maybe five years if it's a trust, the beneficiary is over 
70 and a half. Well, Dave, I thought you said 70. No, this is where 70 and a half comes back. QCDs cannot be made from a 401k or a SEP IRA. So it doesn't work that way. So you're going to want to roll that account to the IRA first and then do the QCD. Okay. And you have a few months to do this. Anyway, that's why I'm helping you now. These accounts have to be done this way or else you don't qualify for step number one. Number two, the distribution. Okay. So this is the withdrawal out of the IRA must transfer. This is important directly to the charity. Now, what designates a charity? The IRS uh, calls these qualified charities. You may want to underline that qualified 501 C three organizations. The list does not include donor advised funds, DAF. So be careful with those because a lot of foundations and other grant making organizations may not qualify for step number two. You're thinking you're doing well here and helping out and maybe they had uh, publications which look like you're in good shape, but then, mm, sorry, you get stuck because you didn't satisfy step number two. So make sure the money you transfer from your IRA to the qualified charity is in fact a qualified charity and will satisfy step number two. Last step three, you must receive a confirmation letter from that qualified charity and the letter must include the following, the statement that no goods or services were received in exchange for your gift. So this is really a great way to do good and use money that you would have otherwise paid income tax on. And by taking this approach, you don't take money from your bank account or paycheck as you might be doing right now because there's a, there's a better, as you can see, tax efficient way to save taxes on your social security and Medicare, which maybe you didn't know about. So obviously this kind of planning is much more than just creating a financial plan and sticking to it. Don't get me wrong. You need to have a plan and improve on it over time with the help of your CPA, state planning attorney and financial advisor. And that's why at our company, we have all three of those to develop your why power, knowing why you want to achieve something, whether you're trying to eat healthy or save for retirement, will help you get focused on your goals. And having the right coach mentor you and show you the why is mission critical at this time of your life. So ask yourself this question, is my current coach or coaches showing me right now how to pay less in taxes on the income and RMDs that I'm going to have to take here in 23 or 24. If the answer is no, well then you're driving a car and looking in the rear view mirror. You're about to hit that wall and you don't even have any idea about it. So take the first step right now to find out how to pay less in taxes. You can pick up the phone right now. If you want help right now, this is complimentary. Call this number, 866-PROTECT. Again, pick up the phone. Talk to a member of my team. They're there right now, right now. 866-776-8328. Chances are you're going to learn something of value from us and save less in taxes next year, which is really what it's all about. Pay less in taxes. 866-PROTECT. Give us a call right now. Coming up next on Protect Your Assets, Larry wanted to know if I'm five years or closer to retirement, should I even be considering converting or contributing money to a Roth IRA or a defined benefit plan? This is a great question, Larry. Keep it right here and you'll find out. We'll be right back. If you missed any of Protect Your Assets with David Hollander, all you have to do is go to PYARadio.com where you can download or listen to our latest shows for free. Just go to PYARadio.com on your computer or mobile device when it's most convenient for you. That's PYARadio.com. Now back to Protect Your Assets with David Hollander, the Sandman. Welcome back. I am David Hollander, also known as the Sandman. And this morning you are listening to Protect Your Assets. And this morning we've been talking about saving taxes on your RMD. Because once you reach a certain age, that's it. You have to start taking money out of certain accounts and paying taxes on it. And speaking of taxes, we do have a caller. We have Mike in San Mateo. Good morning, Mike. 
Hey, how are you, David? Hey, I'm doing great. How can I help you? So I got a kind of two, three part question. I'm going to be receiving a large settlement from a former slash current employer. Okay. Uh, regarding like a whistleblower retaliation. Okay. Um, from what I had kind of looked into it, it looks like I get 1099 and have to pay the full tax of the settlement, even the lawyer's 30% they're taking. Okay. Um, so the lawyer, so let me break that down. So in this case, the lawyer got 30 and that came from your total gross amount, right? Did you, well, let me ask you this. Did you get a 1099 yet or are you expecting to receive it? No, I'm going to be probably in the next week or three. Years. Okay. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Um, so, like I said, from what I'd seen and heard and what they've told me, they're 1099 me for the whole amount. Uh, it seems odd that I'd pay for the lawyer's portion, and then he would in turn pay himself on that. It seems like it's being taxed twice. But my bigger yeah. question is, what can I do to try to limit or lower my tax liabilities when I do receive the settlement? Good Any question. kind of right. yep. funds I can put them into or investments that won't tax me as hard. How old are you, Mike? I am 47. Okay, that's good to know. All right. Okay, so Mike, this is a this is a great question, and and it is complex, and this is the end of my show, so I don't have much time. Um, first thing I'm going to tell you to do is call 866 Protect. Okay, please call that number <laughs> when you get that 1099. Okay. Call us, get let us see a copy of what they send you, and we can we can at least do that complimentary call and help you you know get an idea on this. This is this is a complex issue because the law has split in the subject. There was a case. Uh, that came out not too long ago, which had to do with whistleblower came, um, claims and, and settlements. And the case um, really split in different uh, appellate districts. So, so you know, you're going to be able to deduct some of the, the, the costs and fees that were associated with the particular case. You're going to get a 1099 for the full amount, and so is the attorney. But the way that you show that on your return, and like you're pointing out, there might be some other things you can do with it, will have a big impact on the total amount you're going to pay on your tax return. Okay, so uh, that's why I'm a little, little uh, hot on this issue because it's going to have to be very specific to your situation and exactly what sort of a 1099 you receive. And also your return re receives because they – uh, obviously, I have to share that with you in terms of you know what happened there because they're your attorney. So um, we are happy to help you with this. And the case you want to read about, you can read the case, and it does help lay it out a little bit. It's the uh, the SEC Commission versus Banks B A N K S. Uh, it's 543 mm -hmm. U S 426. That's the appellate case you want to read, which talks about more about this. But um, that case was back in 2005. In 2017, there was no change. So in any event, there's. There's other things we can do here and, um, you know, like, like to help you out there, Mike. So give us a call. 866-PROTECT. Yeah, like we can jump into it. So it's a complex. All right. Should, sure. should, should I worry about the 1099 they're giving me or give you guys a call even before they issue the 1099 so that it's. No, correct? let's get the 1099 and let's, let's take a look at that and we'll come back on it. Awesome. Appreciate okay. your help. You got it. Thanks, Mike. Okay. Bye. -bye. So I know it's hard to break a habit after 30 or 40 years if you've been contributing to a IRA, 401k, 403b, you've created a multi-decade healthy habit of saving. But when you turn 73 or older, it's time to break that habit. Think of it as an IRA contribution cessation program, compliments of the IRS. The dreaded and often confusing RMD is the focus of today's show. If you missed any of it, go check out our podcast where I went over lots of different ways you could do it. So Larry asked me a question. If I'm five years or closer to retirement, should I even be considering converting or contributing money to a Roth or 401k uh, Roth defined or a defined benefit plan? That depends, Larry. Building up a tax-free nest egg gives you flexibility and control as tax rates change. So a Roth in your case could be a terrific asset uh, during retirement or a way to leave more money to your legacy. But again, we should be talking about this and this is a, spe a specific situation that'll be uh, like Mike the caller earlier uh, for you. I mean, every everyone's situation's different, particularly when it comes to taxes. They're sure, there's some general rules out there, but your situation's different. And it does make sense to talk to a qualified attorney who specializes in this. And, and like I said, we are attorneys, we are financial advisors and um, uh, CPAs who do this kind of work, and we're more than happy to help you. Makes sense, right? You bet. All right. Inhale through your nose. 
Exhale through your mouth. Ah, have a nice breathe exercise. Picture a day when you're standing on a beach looking at the Mediterranean and you're trying to decide should you have the rosé or an Aperol spritz. Suddenly your wife or your partner catches your eye and thanks you for making all this happen. Picture a day when you can relax, travel, and do all the things you've always wanted to do. Well, it all starts with a conversation and right now we are doing a survival checkup because it is September after all and you have a few more months to do something about 2023 and taking advantage of these lower tax rates that are out there right now. If you have an IRA, 401k, 403b, 457, pick up the phone and this morning at no charge we will design for you a custom strategy on does a Roth conversion make sense? Call 866-PROTECT the number is 866-PROTECT to see if you can take advantage of these new laws as they relate to Ross. 866-PROTECT is that number this morning. I'd like to give a big thanks to the Protect Your Assets team for putting together a great show today. My executive producer and network manager, Kevin Renfer, and of course all my fabulous producers, Phil, Adrian, and Cam, because without my team, I'm just another pretty voice on the radio. Thanks again, everybody. You have been listening to the Protect Your Assets show. I am David Hollander, the Sandman. Have a great weekend. Go out and make the rest of your life the best of your life. Investment advisory services are offered through Liberty Wealth Management, a registered investment advisor. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. The strategies mentioned are not suitable for everyone. The information expressed is not considered your specific situation or objectives and may not be appropriate for all investors. Past performance is not indicative of future results. To better understand the risk associated with investing and how it reacts to different market conditions, listeners should always consult with their qualified investment professionals, financial advisors, legal or tax specialists and conduct their due diligence before making any financial decisions or taking any action. The legal information provided on the air is not intended to substitute for callers hiring their lawyers to advise them about personal legal matters. Investments involve risk and unless otherwise stated are not guaranteed. Liberty Group LLC paid for the following program and the host's views and opinions do not represent those of the station or its ownership. California Life Agent number 048569. Persons engaging the services of one affiliate of Liberty Group LLC companies should be aware that each company is operated separately. You're listening to the Protect Your Assets Radio Network.